Today we are continuing our Gone Fishing series um, with uh, Fish Fry for 5,000. So this story is one of those stories in the Bible uh, from a historical perspective, uh, having been uh, uh, having a degree in history myself, um, one of the problems with history is lack of sources. And so the more sources you can have for an event, the more likely that it actually occurred. And this is one of those super stories in the gospel. It, it, it occurs in each of the four gospels. So this is one of those stories that sticks out, one of those parables, one of those stories, one of those events that sticks out in the Bible as being something that we can almost be positive that it occurred. You don't get four different people writing four different stories about the same event and have them match up. And that's the great thing about this story is that each one of the Gospels tells a little bit different angle. And um, I chose Matthew's interpretation of this story today. But I'm going to spend a little time in John's Gospel as well with this story. So we are going to, well, dare I say it, we're going to fish around a little bit for the whole story. So, to put it into a timeline, to put it into perspective, um, just before this event occurs in Matthew, Jesus has just found out about the death of John the Baptist. And I think that's why he wanted to get away. I think he was grieving the loss of, of not only somebody in ministry, not only a friend, but we have evidence that John and Jesus were related, maybe even as close as cousins. And so there's this moment, I don't know if you have them, but, but when I lose somebody close, sometimes I just need to be left alone to just get away, to just have some time. Sometimes it's just a few minutes, sometimes it's a few hours, sometimes it may be a few days that I just need to get away from everybody else and give my brain time to process that loss, to grieve, to remember. And so I think Jesus is leaving the group that he is with, leaving the crowds behind because he is looking for some time for peace and quiet to rejuvenate himself, to think about what is happening. And what happens? The crowd follows him. The scripture today talks about Jesus seeing the crowd and Jesus had compassion on them. That's the term that is used in the NRSV. But really, it comes from a Greek word that means kind of tumult. It kind of means um, your stomach is upset. Have you ever been moved that way? Have you ever been so moved to compassion so moved to act that your stomach hurt? When you see something that's wrong and you get upset about it, you get so upset about it that your stomach churns, that's the kind of compassion that is described as what Jesus has for the crowd of people who have followed him as he got in the boat and crossed the lake and they followed him along the lake shore. And he had compassion on them. He was moved. He had a guttural reaction to them. And so Jesus, who is in the midst of grief, sets aside his grief to have compassion on the crowd that follows him. 
And he begins to teach and he begins to heal. And he's there all day. And he's talking to people and he's working with people and he's healing people. I don't know if you've ever done it or not, but it takes a lot out of you. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, to be on for that long. And so he comes into this situation in not a very good state. He has compassion on the people and he's there with them all day. And he's healing and he's teaching and he's talking. And all of a sudden... His disciples come to him and say, hey, tell these people to go away. Because they're going to be hungry and we can't feed them. We don't have enough. We don't have enough money to buy it. We don't have enough with us. And Jesus' response is completely the opposite of logic. He says, you feed them. You do it. You make sure they have something to eat. You feed them. And his disciples say, how can we feed him? We have two fish and five loaves. That's not enough to feed 5,000 men. It's funny. Because that's exactly what it says, that there were 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. And so the estimates vary anywhere from 7,500, and I have heard estimates up to 25,000 people present for this event. But even if you just take 5,000 people, 5,000 people, how many loaves of bread and how many fish would you need to feed 5,000 people. Let that sink in just for a moment. It would be a lot. So here are these people and here are these disciples. And this is where I'm going to go to John. In the book of John, the two fish and the five loaves are credited to a young person. A young person comes to the disciples and he offers his meal to the disciples so they can feed the 5,000. You and I know that five loaves and two fish are not going to feed 5,000 people. But sometimes young people believe things that don't make logical sense in our adult brains. And thank goodness that they do. Because if that story in John is true for all of these other three stories, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, then we know that this young man was a huge part of the miracle. So when we're talking about this event, it starts simply with an act of kindness that is small. A lunch. A lunch is given. You can have my lunch. I don't know if the boy heard them talking about having to feed the 5,000. I don't know if disciples had a conversation off to the side and the young boy heard it and, they, and he offered, he said, here, take my food. You can feed them with my food. I don't know if that's what he said or not, but in my mind, I love to see it that way. I love to see this little boy say to a disciple who is worried about feeding 5,000 people a real present moment problem and this little boy sees the problem 
and hands over his lunch, thinking that he's just solved the problem. And when Jesus says, you feed them, What do you have, he says. What do you have? We have two fish and five loaves. Have all these people set down. Now, in the different Gospels, there are different ways that they set down. In one Gospel, they set them in groups of 50. In another Gospel, they set them in groups of 100. In another Gospel, they just have people set down. But I imagine wherever they are on that mountainside in groups of about 50 people sitting in groups gathered together, probably people who may have known each other, maybe some people that weren't known to each other, but whoever you were with, you gathered around, you sat down, and Jesus breaks and blesses the food in front of them all. And then the disciples hand it out. And in that instant, and I'm not sure what happened. I have no idea. I like to think it is like the wedding feast where the water is put in and Jesus changes it to wine. I want to think that there was a miraculous moment so here are these disciples that have these five loaves and these two fishes, and Jesus places it in baskets that they're carrying around, and as they're walking to their group of 50, all of a sudden their basket becomes heavy laden. That's how I want to believe it in my mind. But there are those who are in scholarship who would say, well, the people who were there probably had meals with them. Because remember, it said there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Now, if there would have been 5,000 men there, I can guarantee you that's how it happened. Because, well, being a man, we don't think about lunch. We just go. But if there were moms there with kids, I know moms had food. Moms don't go anywhere without food if you have kids. It's just the way it is. It's the way moms were wired 2,000 years ago. It's the way moms are wired now. I remember being with my wife and children and saying, he's hungry or she's hungry. And my wife saying, just reach into the bag and get a snack. And I'm like, what are you talking about? In the diaper bag, there's snacks. There's always snacks in the diaper bag. There is? That was my question. There is? Every time, that was my question. I'm not very bright. So some would say that the food was already there, and once these people saw that they were sharing, that the food came out, and the 5,000 men and the women and the children were fed. But I sure do like to think about those baskets filling up as the disciples were walking to those groups of people. I don't know how it happened. You believe what you want to believe. But what does this story teach us about us? God used a boy's lunch, a simple gift, not a big gift, not a gift with grandiose ideas, not a gift that was endowed that would pay forward for generations to come. No, a simple gift to change the lives of all of those people who were there that day. Maybe as many as 25,000 people. God used that simple gift to change people's lives. People come to me and say to me all the time, 
well, Pastor, I really don't have any true talents. I can't really do anything amazing. How is God going to use me? God used two fish and five loaves. Two plus five and made it count for over 5,000. Two plus five does not equal 5,000. Never has, never will. But that day, it did. That one day on the mountainside, two plus five equaled 5,000 plus. And how is it that you can make something simple go a long way? When you give $10 to the ramp fund, a bunch of other people give $10 to the ramp fund, and all of a sudden, it's a ramp. When you bring in a school kit or a health kit or a period pack, it makes a difference to the person who receives it. Right now, in stores all over the place, school supplies are on sale. And did you know that right now you can buy things tax-free? It's happening right now. In Ohio, anything under $500 that is not alcohol, tobacco, motorized, or a pleasure craft, or marijuana, tax-free in the state of Ohio, up to $500. So if you go to the store today and you buy your children's school supplies or grandchildren's school supplies for the year, you will save enough in taxes to put together a school kit. Money that you would have spent anyways, a small gift added to the pile. And the pile is beginning to grow. There are more things that are beginning to show up here. And if you make five and I make five and somebody else makes two and somebody brings in one, all of a sudden it fills up the back of my truck when I go to deliver it. And it's amazing to see a church this size give so much. But when you look at your one thing or your three things or your five things, you think, well, this really doesn't make a difference. But I'm here to tell you that when there's a natural disaster and somebody gets a health kit that has a washcloth and a bar of soap and a toothbrush in it, and they get a bottle of water, and they're able to clean up and feel better, it makes a huge difference in that person's life. If a woman in the midst of a natural disaster and her community is completely wiped out and her monthly cycle begins and she gets that feminine hygiene pack, it makes a huge difference. Or a kid on an Indian reservation whose family doesn't have any money gets a school kit that has colored pencils and a ruler and erasers and notebook. And he doesn't have to go to school without or she doesn't have to go to school without. It makes a huge difference. Your little gift can make a huge impact on our world. Tuesday. National Night Out. I'm inviting you all to come. Every one of you. Whether you have kids, whether you want to be there, yes, it's supposed to rain. If it rains, I don't expect you to come, I understand. But if it's not raining, show up. If you have a shirt, if you have your kindness campaign shirt, wear it. In the bulletin today is one of these. 
you don't have to explain anything. It's written on there. And I'm not asking you to hand these out to everybody. What I want you to do is I want you to have two or three of these with you. And when you meet somebody you know, not that goes to this church, and you stop to have a conversation with them, give them one of these. Say, my church is doing this. It's a kindness campaign. And I want to invite you to be a part of it. I want to invite you to be a part of changing our community. That's it. And when they say, what's it about? Take the other one you have in your hand and read it right out loud. This election season, we're campaigning for kindness. Read it. When division feels all too common during the election season, we can choose a better way. You don't even have to read it well. Just read it. It explains exactly what it is that we're doing. It'll begin a conversation. And conversations are what cause change. Little tiny pieces at a time. You don't have to be Billy Graham and change the world. You just have to be you. And you have to bring what it is that you have at this moment. And if all you have is a kid on your hip and a diaper bag and a snack, know that it's enough. Because there's somebody else out there who's got a kid on their hip and a diaper bag and maybe no snack. And maybe your snack is what makes the difference in their day and changes their life forever. You see, that is the amazing thing about God. God uses what we think is insignificant and does great things with it. The disciples thought that day, this is just a kid's lunch. What good is this going to do? Won't even feed the 12 of us, let alone feed 5,000. You need to send these people away. But God doesn't see it the way you and I see it. You and I see it with human eye. God sees it with eternal eyes. God sees it with omnipotent eyes. God knows what your small gift can do. So please don't come to me and say, I can't do it. Because you can. You can Change the world for God. Through God, you can change the world. Maybe just make it a little nicer. And really, don't we need a little bit nicer world? When we talk about fishing for people, I'm not talking about netfuls. I'm talking about one person at a time. One person you already know. One person you already love. One person who's important to you that can be transformed. And you never know you never know. <laughs> Trust me. When I was in first grade, my Sunday school teacher probably never thought I'd be doing this. <laughs> she was just happy that I sat in the seat, <coughs> let alone would preach. You never know who it is that you're going to influence for God and that God is going to use to do great things. So your talent, your gift, what you have is enough and God can use it to perform miracles if you'll have the faith to give it. If you'll have that compassion that stirs your stomach to make you want to help other people, God will use it to change the world. Of that, I am sure. 
So just remember, a fish fry for 5,000 seems overwhelming for us. But for God, it's just another day at work. Will you pray with me? God of grace and mercy, we give thanks that you are a God of miracles. Help us. Help us to be ready to join you wherever you're at work and give us the faith to give our small gift that you will make great through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We saw in today's story where Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. This is a reoccurring theme in the Gospels. We are celebrating communion today. Communion in the United Methodist tradition is available to everyone. You don't have to be a member. Uh, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. Everyone is welcome at Christ's table. We are going to do communion by intinction. That means there's pieces of bread here. If you'll take a piece of bread off of the plate. You can dip it into the juice, and then you'll take it. If you would like to have contactless communion, there are cups over here in this corner and back in that corner that have everything in them. The juice is there, the wafer is there, and you do not have to have contact with other people. We understand that need that you might have. You are invited to communion here today because God's love covers all. On the night he was betrayed, as he gathered for a meal with his disciples, Christ took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, he lifted it, he gave thanks to God, he handed it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And at the end of that meal, he took a cup. Again, he lifted it up to God, he gave thanks, and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, take, drink, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, remember me. Jesus' disciples had just been served communion, and they didn't have any idea that that's what it was. Jesus' disciples knew about God's forgiveness, and they had heard Jesus' message, but they didn't fully understand until the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. You don't have to fully understand God to take communion. You're welcome at the table. Even if you don't believe, even if you're slightly confused, even if you don't understand. Because the communion table is a mystery that changes lives. I've had classes, I've had tests, I know the right words to say, but I really don't understand communion completely because no one can. It's God's gift to us. Forgiveness given freely that sets us free from sin for eternity. It's impossible for my brain to wrap around. But I have faith and I believe. And so I come to the table to know God's mercy and forgiveness. And you're invited. 
Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we ask your presence here that this bread and this cup would be for us your body and blood broken and shed that we might remember you and that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us that we would know your forgiveness and feel it in our hearts, freeing us from sin to be an adopted child of God, fully one of God's children. It's in Jesus' name that we pray for all of this. Amen. Would those who have offered to serve communion please come forward? Come, the table's prepared.
Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that is found in you. Help us to keep that forgiveness in our heart. Help us to remember that you free us from sin. From this day forward, through all eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go forth from this place and be a part of a miracle. Amen. <laughs>